It would be the last homely house east of the sea, the great elven refuge of the north. Not only would it become known for its peaceful atmosphere and being Aragorn's childhood home, but also the starting point for the greatest army of the Second Age. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover the history of Rivendell. The story of Imladris begins as the War of the Elves and Sauron begins. With Sauron having sacked the city of Austin Ethil, Elrond leads an army from Linden in an attempt to aid the elves of Eregion. Elrond is met by a group of these elves led by Celeborn. Despite the reinforcement, they are unable to reach the realm as Sauron's forces are simply too great. As Elrond is facing utter defeat, the elves are saved by the dwarves of Khazad-dûm, who attack Sauron's rear guard, dividing his attention and allowing the elves to retreat. Elrond leads the elves north along the Bruinen to the valley near the Misty Mountains, establishing Imladris, which means Deep Dale of the Cleft. It becomes a safe haven for elven refugees as Sauron continues his march throughout all of Eriador. Among these refugees of Eregion is of course Celeborn. Sauron's great army not only makes its way ever closer to Linden, but also lays siege to Imladris. Finally, in 1700 of the Second Age, a great force of Numenorians arrive in Linden to aid the elves of Middle-earth. Gilgalad, who is barely holding the line near the river Lún, is reinforced by the Numenorians, and they drive back the forces of Sauron. The siege of Rivendell is broken, and Sauron is driven from Eriador the following year, retreating back to Mordor. At this time, Gilgalad gives to Elrond his Ring of Power, Vilya, the Ring of Air. We are also told around this time that a meeting was held of the White Council. We are not told exactly who took part, though it would not include later members Gandalf and Saruman, as they would not arrive in Middle-earth until 1000 of the Third Age. However, it is decided in this meeting that Imladris would become a new stronghold of the Elves in Eriador, and that Elrond would rule there as Gilgalad's vice-regent. That same year, Galadriel and her daughter Celebrion come to Rivendell searching for Celeborn. Celebrion would not only discover her father alive and well, but it is here she would first meet Elrond. Over 1700 years later, Rivendell would host one of the greatest armies ever assembled in Middle-earth. As Sauron moves against Gondor, Gilgalad and Elendil form the last alliance of elves and men at Amon Sul and march to Rivendell. The army spends the next three years there, gathering their forces, forging weapons, and making battle plans. In 3434, Elrond marches with Gilgalad in the War of the Last Alliance, but only one would return. With the death of Gilgalad, Elrond could have claimed the title of High King of the Noldor, but he would not, as there were so few Noldor remaining in Middle-earth. He returns to Rivendell, where it would thrive under his rule and with the help of his Ring of Power. Remaining in Rivendell are Isildur's wife and youngest son, Valendil. It is when Isildur is on his return journey to Rivendell years later that he and his three eldest sons are killed in the disaster of the Gladden Fields. Thus, Valendil would be the first of the heirs of Isildur to be fostered in Rivendell living there until he was 21 years old, when he would take the rule of the Northern Kingdom of Arnor. In 109 of the Third Age, Elrond and Celebrion are married and go on to have three children. The twin sons, Eladan and Elrohir, are born in 130, and their daughter Arwen follows in 241. Over the centuries of the Third Age, Rivendell would remain a refuge of the heirs of Isildur, men who were related to Elrond himself through his brother and the first king of Numenor, Elros. Rivendell and Arnor would remain allies throughout the latter's existence. However, both realms would face a great enemy around 1300 of the Third Age, as the Witch Kingdom of Angmar is established in the north. The Angmar War would last for over 600 years, 
In the early days of the conflict, Angmar would attack Rivendell, resulting in the second siege of Imladris. By 1409, the siege is broken as Elrond is reinforced by elves from Lothlorien and Linden, driving the forces of Angmar from their lands and subduing the Witch King for many years. By 1975, the remnants of Arnor cease to exist at the end of the Angmar War, and their people only continue in the form of the Dúnedain Rangers. Beginning with Arahel, the second chieftain of the Dúnedain, the heirs of Isildur would be fostered in Rivendell, down their line all the way to Aragorn. It is also at this time that the heirlooms of their house would be moved to Rivendell, now that their kingdom was no more. Among these are the Shards of Narsil. Throughout the Third Age, Rivendell would play host to many travelers, making their way between the eastern and western portions of Middle-earth. In 2941, Bilbo makes his first journey to Rivendell as a member of Thorin's company. During this time, we also get our first description of the greatness of Elrond's realm. His house was perfect. Whether you liked food, or sleep, or work, or storytelling, or singing, or just sitting and thinking best, or a pleasant mixture of them all, evil things did not come into that valley. Not only would Bilbo return there on his way home with Gandalf, but he would also move to Rivendell after his 111th birthday. With the exception of a few later life travels, Bilbo would live out most of his remaining days in Middle-earth in the House of Elrond, writing his book. In 3018, Frodo Baggins would make his journey bearing the One Ring to Rivendell, and it is here that we would see the defensive power of Imladris through the magic of Elrond and Gandalf. Frodo defies the Nazgul pursuing him to the ford of Bruinen, who are swept away by the river. Gandalf later tells Frodo of their magic defense. Who made the flood? asked Frodo. Elrond commanded it, answered Gandalf. The river of this valley is under his power, and it will rise in anger when he has great need to bar the ford. As soon as the captain of the ring race rode into the water, the flood was released. If I may say so, I added a few touches of my own. You may not have noticed, but some of the waves took the form of great white horses with shining white riders, and there were many rolling and grinding boulders. For a moment, I was afraid we had let loose too fierce a wrath, and that the flood would get out of hand and wash you all away. There is great vigor in the waters that come down from the snows of the Misty Mountains. During this trip to Rivendell, we are also introduced to a special location, the Hall of Fire, where the hobbits are reunited with Bilbo. This is the Hall of Fire. Here you will hear many songs and tales, if you can keep awake. But except on high days, it usually stands empty and quiet, and people come here who wish for peace and thought. There is always a fire here, all year round, but there is little other light. Further showing the importance of both Rivendell and Elrond, the hobbits not only meet Bilbo in Elrond's house, but folk from all about Middle-earth, seeking his counsel. Gimli and Glowin from the Lonely Mountain, Legolas from the Woodland Realm, and Boromir of Gondor. All would take part in the Great Council of Elrond, and on December 25th, the Fellowship of the Ring would depart Rivendell on the hopeless errand to destroy the One Ring. Rivendell next comes into the story after the One Ring's destruction, the marriage of Aragorn and Arwen, and the funeral of King Theoden. We are told that Gandalf and the hobbits say goodbye to many of their friends at Isengard and accompany Elrond back to Rivendell. With the One Ring destroyed, the power of Elrond's ring would diminish as well. He remains in Rivendell for roughly two years before departing on the White Ship with Gandalf, Galadriel, Bilbo, Frodo, and Shadowfax sailing to the Undying Lands. Though Elrond had departed Middle-earth and Arwen was now Queen of Gondor, two of their family would remain in Rivendell. Elrond's twin sons, Elidan and Elrohir, remain behind for at least some time. With the departure of his wife, Celeborn grows weary of Lorien 
and it is believed that he would also relocate to Rivendell. At some point after the year 61 of the Fourth Age, Celeborn would sail with Círdan on the last ship, taking the last memories of the Elder Days to Valinor. As for Elrond's sons, we don't know if they eventually sailed west themselves, or perhaps moved elsewhere in Middle-earth to linger on. But as Aragorn is nearing death in 120 of the Fourth Age, he says to Arwen that none now walk in the Garden of Elrond, implying that by this time, Rivendell had finally faded and the elves had departed the Great Realm forever. As we look at one last description of Rivendell, my wish for all this holiday is that we would all find our own little slice of Imladris where we can escape the worries of the world. For a while, the hobbits continued to talk and think of the past journey and of the perils that lay ahead. But such was the virtue of the land of Rivendell that soon all fear and anxiety were lifted from their minds. The future, good or ill, was not forgotten, but ceased to have any power over the present. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Kella Brimbor, Jim Limber Davis, Listen Me the Cinda, Mandu Pandu, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Berto Berg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.